Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. In my last video, I gave an overview, basically, of what I would be talking about uh, right at the moment. So I'm going to talk about two things. The first thing I'm going to talk about is that climate change needs an operation warp speed. A year ago, we got hit by the coronavirus. Back money, governments pump all kinds of money into research into coming up with new vaccines. A year later, the world has numerous vaccines. Many, many countries have their own vaccines and other countries are getting multiple vaccines from multiple sources, all different types. So it appears that many of them work. Normally, it takes 10 years to develop a new vaccine. Okay, so uh, it's not just in the U.S. Operation Warp Speed. Uh, this was in many, many countries. It was cooperation at the global level to come up with something. And we need, climate change needs an Operation Warp Speed. So come up with a better acronym, but I call it COWS, C-O-W-S, Climate Operation Warp Speed. We need to work hard until the cows come home. Right, you've heard this expression. We need the cows to come home. We need the climate operation warp speed. Um, yeah, I know it's it's terrible humor, but uh, anyway, the other thing I want to talk about is another tipping point that we're yet approaching. I'll talk about ocean tipping points very very soon, um, based on a new peer-reviewed paper that's come out in the last month. But right now, I'm going to talk about terrestrial tipping points. A recent paper came out on the Amazon um, going from a sink of carbon to a source, and I'll talk about the peer-reviewed paper that discusses that separately. But I'm going to talk about a paper that's all about the tipping point of the terrestrial um, system. The terrestri like, so there's a strong temperature dependence of photosynthesis on land um, and respiration. And we've actually passed the peak in the last decade of the photosynthesis curve. So as temperature increases, respiration still increases and photosynthesis decreases. So right now the land plants absorb about 30% of anthropogenic carbon emissions. That's about 2.6 petagrams of carbon per year. But if the trends in temperature rise increase, then the land sink will be reduced by half in the next 20 years to more like 15% of anthropogenic carbon emissions or 1.3 petagrams of carbon. And this is going to be horrible news because it means that the carbon dioxide levels will skyrocket in the atmosphere. So we don't have any time. We need to, we need this climate operation warp speed. So let's look at the uh, papers where I'm getting this. Okay, so this is a, this came out in Wired. This is an excellent article if you haven't read it. So the COVID vaccine push, if it's proved anything, it's a big government works. Okay, now why is, okay, there we go. Okay, so in the early days of the pandemic, a vaccine seemed very far off. Historically, the average time to develop a new vaccine is 10 years, far too long for our current emergency. But then something happened to shift things into overdrive, serious government action. The White House and Congress created Operation Warp Speed and started plowing some 18 billion into it. The rest of the world followed suit. The governments around the world plowed huge amounts of dollars into developing vaccines. The feds authorize huge multi-billion dollar pre-orders for vaccines. So with a guaranteed market, pharmaceuticals moved into high gear. The government also threw its logistical know-how at the hellish, hellish challenge of distributing the vaccines. Scientifically, we were prepared and lucky. Prepared because genetic sequencing was well advanced and quick. Scientists cooperated globally. But it was the critical push from governments, the U.S. and others, that propelled the fastest vaccine mobilization in history. So this is a lesson for our time. When you're facing a world-threatening crisis, there's no substitute for government leadership. 
Okay, this is worth reflecting on because we're surrounded by existential threats, principally climate change. The scale of the problem is massive. So we need a climate operation warp speed, cows. The U.S. government should throw its muscle behind ramping up a mammoth rapid rollout of all forms of renewable energy. That includes solar and wind, which we can know how to build well, but also geothermal, small nuclear, cutting edge forms of energy storage and transmission. Okay, it's not as if they haven't done anything on renewables. Tax credits for solar are why adoption is up and the price is down. But the spending's been chump change compared to the terrifying scale of climate change. Over the past 40 years, the U.S. has spent 37% more on R&D for fossil fuels and for renewables. So a climate operation warp speed should invert that ratio. Okay. I mean, the Fed's vaccine purchase propelled pharmaceutical companies to move so bloody fast with COVID-19. They're not just going to make a bunch of vaccine that's going to sit on a shelf and nobody's going to buy. So they pre-bought it. They created the market. With renewables, they, the U.S. government and other governments around the world should pledge to buy as much clean energy as firms can make. And then that will really cause a huge um, growth of the, the market. If the government says, look, we'll buy the first batch um, you know, of whatever type of energy source there is that's renewable, then scientists will do what they do best with engineers. They'll focus on the science and they'll build the devices. It's more than cash, it's logistics, right? The op organizational oomph of the government and military to bring, could bring clean energy to every federal building nationwide. Cutting red tape too. I mean, this was done during Operation Warp Speed for vaccine component firms. Okay, carbon sequestration, capturing carbon needs warp speed treatment too. Startups and labs have dreamed up prototypical hardware for scrubbing carbon from the atmosphere but it's a tough engineering challenge. It needs early support. In the long run, there may well be a robust, robust market for extracted carbon transformed into fuel or construction materials like concrete, for example. But in the short run, it's just an expensive pile of extracted carbon. The Fed should buy it. Okay, and libertarian friends might protest, but wait, won't government spending distort these markets? Can't free enterprise bootstrap truly world-changing new tech all on its own? Nope, it rarely has. The free market regarded nearly every foundational digital tech in its early years as a costly boondoggle and had little interest. Transistors, integrated circuits. Back in the 50s and 60s, the first batches were janky messes. It took the Department of Defense pouring dough into startup firms like Fairchild Semiconductor to bring costs down, reliability up. So 20 years later, we get the Apple one, right? So there you go. Um, there's a book on this. It's always been the symbiosis of public and private as Margaret O'Mara, historian and author of the book, The Code, A History of, History of Silicon Valley tells me. It sounds like a good book worth getting. So we need a warp speed for the climate. Now, I want to talk a little bit about plants. So C3 plants, are, most plants are C3 plants. CO2 is captured through the stomata, reacts in this cycle and builds up plant material. Oxygen is released and water is both input and output through the stomata. C4 plants are the grasses and they include things like corn. And there's an extra step here where the CO2 is fixed in a different cell and before going into the cycle. Okay, so this is a good summary. There's also a third type. So C3 plants are most plants. C4 are tropical grasses like corn and sugarcane. Cam plants are succulents, pineapple. Um, okay, C3 plants fix carbon in the Calvin cycle. These guys fix carbon in cells above the, um, above the, um, cyto in the cytoplasm and then they attach the carbon. So there's an extra step with the C4 plants. Uh, in terms of water, C3 plants lose water a lot through photorespiration. C4 plants lose less water and CAM plants lose the least. Okay, so there's these type of plants and they react differently to temperature rise. So here's the paper. How close are we to the temperature tipping point of the terrestrial biosphere? Okay, we're getting very close. The land sink currently mitigates about 30% of anthropogenic carbon emissions. Okay, but as temperature increases, 
right now the at the mean temperature of the warmest quarter, the three month period, it passes the thermal maximum for photosynthesis. It passed it during the last decade. So at higher temperatures, respiration rates continue to rise exponentially. They're sharply declining exponential decre decreases of photosynthesis. So under business as usual, this divergence will cause a near halving of the land strength as early as 2040. As early as 20 years from now, the land will only um, mitigate about 15% of anthropogenic carbon emissions. The other 15% will go into the atmosphere. So CO2 levels in the atmosphere will, will take off. This is a, a huge problem. And, you know, this paper is open source. Have a look at it. Right now, the 30% of anthropogenic emissions annually that's captured by the land is 2.6 petagrams of carbon per year. And when that's halved down to 1.3, 15% of anthropogenic emissions, we're, we're, we'll pass that tipping point for the land where the land becomes a source of carbon rather than a sink. This is a huge problem. I just want to show you the graphs. This is with C3 photosynthesis peaks at about 18 degrees Celsius. So the curve photosynthesis increases till you get to about 18 the peak and then it drops off. With C4 plants, the max is about 28 degrees Celsius. Okay, now when you take the C3, C4 mix, you can get an overall global photosynthesis curve, and that's in the next figure I'll show you. But this is respiration, increasing exponentially. This thing only peaks at 60 degrees Celsius uh, for leaf respiration, 70 degrees Celsius for soil respiration. So there's a huge mismatch here. Okay, and uh, so here's the land sink of carbon with temperature. And this is global photosynthesis here. And this is respiration here. Okay, so basically we're reaching, here is the current climate, you know, in these regions here. So we passed the peak of the uh, global photosynthesis. We passed the peak where the land is absorbing most carbon. Now, as temperature continues to rise, the respiration continues to increase. That's putting CO2 into the atmosphere. The photosynthesis continues to decrease, uh, which is, the, so in other words, the amount of CO2 that's removed from the atmosphere is decreased. The sink is decreasing. This is very, very bad news. Um, this is the planet here. This is the months uh, per, presently, the months above Tmax, um, which is the max for the photosynthesis in the current climate. So there's some regions that are surpassing, that are, have surpassed the max. This is what we expect in 2040. By the worst case scenario, which we're tracking, as I showed in previous videos with Peter Carter's slides, RCP 8.5. Okay, um, if we track that, look at all of these regions that become, have many, many cum more cumulative months above Tmax. So the C3 plants are really suffering and the C4 plants starting to suffer. Um, so global food supplies will be severely affected. And this is just in 20 years. This is the current biosphere productivity um, at, at a function of latitude, okay? So very high at the equator. And there's another peak here, about 50 degrees. So in the northern uh, farming regions. And here's what we expect in, by 2040 to 2060 in the RCP 8.5 scenario, a huge drop, a drop of at least 45%. The biosphere productivity, if you go to 2070 to 2090, there's not much drop from 2040 to 2060. The reason is, is that the rainforests are very sensitive and the taiga, the, the uh, forests in northern Canada and Russia are very sensitive to temperature. So this is a huge problem. This is a huge problem. And uh, those are the key figures. Okay, so... You know, when I talk about global food shortages, uh, you know, growing plants, um, you know, is going to be a problem. Most plants um, have that temperature um, maximum because they're C3 plants of, of uh, 18 degrees Celsius. It's only the things like corn and succulents that are higher, that are a bit more durable, 28 degrees Celsius, but respiration is ever increasing. So we're heading to a world of global food shortages. Thank you for listening. Bye for now.